Jilani step aside Makalima. <laughs> How are you? Well, thank you. Thank you so much. First of all, I need to give you credit. You're a hard man to pin down. Like, uh, how, ma how many years has it been? I've been trying to do this. <laughs> how many years? Yeah, I try to stay uh, away from the media, keep a low profile. So, when I was thinking back at how we're going to do this, because I've been stewing this for years. Right. Like, when I finally get the opportunity to do this, how I'm, how, how I'm going to do this. Uh, I, I came up with with three people I'd love to meet. Okay. And hopefully those three people are going to tell me the story I want to hear from three different vantage points. Now, I'm not going to tell you who these people are. Okay. Right? But hopefully at the end, I'm going to tell you who these people are. But the common denominator with those three people is you. Wow. Is that okay? That's fine. Okay. That's fine. So that, that, that's my challenge. The success of all of this uh, lies on me meeting these three people. Three different period, uh, three different parts of your life, and and hopefully they'll tell me the story that I want to hear. Okay. So, what so story do you want to hear? The story I want to hear is how how does this all start? Where, where does it begin? Let's talk growing up. Like, where did you grow up? Where were you born? I was born in Harare. Uh, at the time it was called Salisbury, but um, yeah, I grew up in Harare. Um, two wonderful parents. Uh, my father is Zulu, my mother is Tosa. Um, very modest family. We, you know, I got four other siblings. I'm the first of five. Um, I only have one sister and, and three other brothers. And yeah, it's, it's, it was a very humble home, you know, um, very modest living. Um, my mother was a housewife. My dad, you know, was the breadwinner. And uh, both were very musical in terms of the love of music. Not that they, they, you know, participated in anything in the music industry. Um, and within all of that, I discovered something um, when I was very young. I think maybe when I was six, seven or so, I, I discovered that I really had a love for music. And... I used to just get afforded the opportunity to listen to music during, you know, my spare time. Was some of the music that, that shaped or that drew you to that aha moment, that chasmic moment where you're like, snap, I like music. What was mom listening to? What's dad listening to? What's playing on the radio? What's playing in the country? Mom listened to a lot of gospel, uh, a lot of Mbatanga. So you'd find, you know, we listened to a lot of uh, the Soul Brothers, um, I'm a Swazi Velo, you know, they're from Swaziland. Right. Um, my dad was a bit into everything. He liked a lot of the modern sound as well. Um, he listened to a lot of Afro jazz, so you, Dollar Brand or Ibram Abdul. Um, you know, we would hear that every single morning uh, or least every Sunday. You know, he would play it nice and loud. What, was there like a culture at the house of when to listen to music? Because I know for a fact that the radio set in the house yeah. was just not something that you play around with. People used to gather on radio sets. That's how important the radio set was. Yeah, well, it wasn't really a culture. It was just, uh, you know, I grew up hearing a lot of music just around me. Um, Dad liked to play it nice and loud whenever he got the moment. Um, but I just found myself drawn to, you know, just radio. Um, I insisted at the age of six that my parents buy me a little small small little radio. So they bought me a little battery operated radio. It was blue in color. Um, and I'd spend my time just glued to it. I didn't watch television. Um, yeah, TV was not, <laughs> it wasn't sort of the thing I was, uh, was drawn to at the time. And it's amazing you say that because at the time, television was still very new uh, in terms of just African programming. So it was yeah. still fascination. And, it started, this and it started at four o'clock or five o'clock, you know. So there was a lot of time after school just to, you know, pick up, try to hear what DJs were playing on, on radio. Right. Um, but that's when I sort of began to sort of, uh, I think, find that there was a love for it. Um, I used to write down song lyrics. Um, I used to 
memorize, uh, you know, s songs. I used to, we got to a point where, uh, you know, we had a little cassette recorder and I would spend my time just trying to collect as much as I can. So um, that became sort of my, you know, my diet, really. If outside of homework, just music. Um, outside of, I uh, hardly played with friends. Um, and if I did, it was just the occasional, you know, football here and there. But I spent a lot of my time just immersed in the music, trying to know who was the artist, who did what, where it was recorded, who that artist was, you know, um, trying to get the, the idea, the background. And, and, and music information at the time, it's not like today, yeah. where, where you have Google, where literally you can type anything and you can yeah. find everything from who did the backings to who sharpened the pencil yes. to everything at the time. So, uh, which means you really were really passionate about this for you to then yeah. get into the crux of... It was really just sort of listening a lot to the DJs and drawing different information from different presenters at the time on radio. So. Who are some of those presenters? Um, John Matinde, oh if I God. remember. Legend. Uh, Hilton Mambo, um, just to name a few. Kudzima Rudza was around at the time. Um, Josh Makawa. Um, Josh Makawa, you had also admired Tadera. You know, Eunice Koto, uh, exactly. Uh, Musi Kumalo. A little bit of Titch. Mataz, yeah, Mataz <laughs> came uh, a little later. Yeah. yeah, he came a lot later with the Ozia Singendes. Ozia Singendes. You know, um, but I spent my time sort of, you know, grabbing bits and I listened to every show, I listened to every word. I, I, was, I was studying what was pop music, what was, you know, at least I didn't know then, but it seemed like I was studying what was pop music, what, what made it good. Um, but Michael Jackson, I think, triggered it all for me. I think from that thriller moment, uh, that was my personal grab on it. Outside of all the other music that I'd been listening to, I'd been listening to ABBA through my dad. Uh, I'd been listening to The Carpenters, uh, The Beatles, and what my parents were listening to. A lot of African music as well had come through at the time as well that I'd been picking up from your uh, Selo Twala, Brenda Fase, mm -hmm. uh, Pat mm -hmm. Shange, Shimora, Dalom Kids, Ooh. you know, Fela Kuti, Yvonne Chaga Chaga later, yes. So there was a lot of that that I was sort of grabbing um, and sort of separating. And as well, I used to switch and I used to listen to people like Eric Knight. Radio 2. Radio 2, exactly. Yes. You know, you listen to some of the Radio 2 presenters. Switch again, go to Radio 1, listen to the more laid back classical. So. I got a great, uh, I would say maybe array of music, you know, influences just coming into my ear. And that's sort of when I began to, to, to dream of the notion of wanting to be either a radio presenter, you know, or being involved in that music space. Right. Um, I, I, and I could sing because I was already in the school choir. Which school was this? Uh, Groombridge Primary. Oh yeah. Yeah. Groombridge Primary. So yeah. you're a Groombridge Primary boy? Yeah. And then you cross over to high school. Where did you do at high school? Uh, I was at Peter House Boys. Ah. Yeah. And how was that experience? And how much did it shape your palate? That time, outside of everything I'd already uh, identified, by 11 I sort of knew that this is a sort of space that I want to play in. But I didn't know how to play an instrument. So when I got to high school, um, my dad, graciously offered for me to take up piano lessons. Um, but then somewhere, I don't know where I heard it, I felt, no, that wouldn't be the way to go. Because um, I had always been, you know, fed information that once you learn how to play a musical instrument, you sort of get boxed in. You know, you learn how to play a certain way, you learn how to, you know, you, you, you learn pretty much what others have sort of done and you, you sort of stay in that space and I felt I didn't want to limit my creativity. I was already writing songs at that point. I was already right. composing little melodies. Um, so I'd started off, what I used to do is that I would take someone else's song, replace all the lyrics first. So I'd write my own lyrics on someone else's melody. Then my mother got the bright spark one day when I was presenting to her some of my lyrics. She says, you know, son, this is all great. Your lyrics are nice, but you now need to come up with your own tunes. 
you know, so I got now to start, you know, doing my own tunes. So by the time I got to high school, I had certain songs that I had already written that I couldn't play, but I, I could hum them, I knew the melodies. And I discovered a thing called a piano. And I thought, okay, let's start learning. So I started teaching myself from one finger to two fingers, to three, to four, to five, to two hands. And before you know it, I started playing. Um, so you're self-taught? I'm self-taught. Piano player? Yeah. Um, I was just taught how to put my hands on a piano by a young, young guy who was, who was already learning music uh, at high school, Alex Cresswell. He, he taught me that you no know, position like this, but from then on I was trying to figure out the notes. And it started off just by playing bass notes because you know, you've, got, you've got the tune, so you, you kind of like know what the bass line is going to sound like. So I started playing with the bass notes and then from then on I started putting the harmonics and then before you know it, I kept evolving and practicing and practicing. I used to disappear. <laughs> when I say disappear, during prep, we had prep time after dinner. Right. So I would, uh, it's a boarding school, so uh, I would disappear. We'd all get called in, we're doing our prep. So everybody's in the whole school. All is quiet because everybody's studying. Right. I would sneak off in the middle of prep and I'd go into the chapel. Now, Peter House has got a very huge chapel and it was dark, but I couldn't switch on the light. Because they would see you. Because they would see me. So I literally relied on the outside lights that were coming in and I started learning how to play in the dark quietly. And slowly but surely, I kept doing that every single day. Um, for, for several years. For several years, six years of, yeah. you're, you're there for six years? There for four years, yeah. For four years? Yeah. Oh my goodness. And then I, I pushed in terms of just learning how to, you know, play. Every time we'd finished, we had a school break. I'd go to the, to the piano school, to the music school, and I would learn how to continue to practice how to. Uh, you, you were growing up at a time where Zimbabwe was starting to find itself. Uh, okay. By that I mean we had, we had previously been Rhodesia. Yes. We're crossing over to become Zimbabwe. Yes. Uh, there's a whole new urban scene that's shaping up. Yes. Things that were possible, they, they were not possible before started being possible. Yeah. Uh, expression that was unheard of started being possible and yeah. people are starting to define themselves uh, also parallel to a very global market. Right. right? Through um, Radio 3 defining the zeitgeist of the time of what urban youths are doing, yes. right? Yeah. Uh, and all that's popping and happening, but you're growing in that space. And you're also seeing people who are starting to see what's happening in the US and try to play it at home. Yeah. And try to reproduce some of that. Yeah. Because Zimbabwe had been very linear at the time in terms of music. It was very yeah. Sungura, Mbira, and a whole lot of that. Mm -hmm. so, so, so who are some of the artists that shaped that era of the, the infancy of urban music during that time? I felt, um, start off with the Rusike brothers. Uh, they were definitely part of that. The Bundu boys shaped that era as well, you know, with the jit jive, with a lot of electronic synths mixed up with a bit of the traditional rhythm. Um, there was the likes of Rosala Miller that came through Ilanga and Don Gumbo. Uh, Andy Brown with Busingulwe, part of that whole uh, coalition, and Fanya Natube, not forgetting him. Then there was Love Moma Jaivana. What just, a man. Just, you know, who he brought in as well, the traditional side of, um, you know, the Ndebele side of, uh, of, the, of the urban sound of music, mixing it and infusing as, as, well, as well with a lot of the, um, you know, the the modern the modern approach. Right. Um, we also saw the birth of people like Comrade Chinks, Tasso, um, I think from from that, who were just some of the more uh, sort of, you know, below the surface artists uh, through the assistance of people like Keith Farkasen as an engineer, as a producer. Um, and Keith Farkasen, I felt, played a very, very crucial role in being able to, uh, you know, 
offer artists a, a platform through his studio um, that recorded quite a number of people that, you know, I mean, I'm sure there's dozens to mention, you know, who sort of went through their hands. He sort of perfected the sound as well and brought that more independent. I think one of the first players to play in that independent studio space, uh, if I recall care carefully. What was his studio? Do you, do you know where his studio was? Yeah, I visited Keith's studio several times. Uh, the one that I went to was deep, deep in Helensvale before the Borrowdale Brook area. I think we're in just still horse farms. Yeah, it was still horse farms. Yeah. So right, so where Borrowdale Brook is, you keep going further down. Uh, yeah, I don't know if his family home is there, but that's where, you know, that's one studio that I, I know I definitely did visit. He did la later shift to towards, um, is it Greendale? Greendale, Masasa uh, area where he operated from the shed, shed, the shed space. Uh, but that was much, much later on. Right. Uh, you had people like Isaac Chirua who were part of that, that, that move bringing in something else he brought that little that funk yeah you know Isaac, Isaac Isaac is one of those phenomenal people, man phenomenal man but yeah. really mentioned in this story yeah it really does that we, we we hardly talk about the, the the genius that he is do you remember Matt Tonto I do Calvin Moosey yes yes good friends good friends who is yeah. producing those guys they produce themselves what yeah they were based in the UK and they so were, they've been always based in the UK? No, I mean, we all know they grew up in Zim, but there was a time when they, you know, people started leaving, whether they were going there for school or for otherwise, but most of that Matonto production was done overseas. It was too nice, it was too yeah. crisp, it yeah. was too on point. Very clean, very clean. Uh, so you're telling me Rick is like Tombo Fada, yeah. Nam Nam? From what, I, from what I gather, they were done in the UK. What? Um, from what I gather, but I stand corrected. Was radio playing? all these local artists, especially Radio 3? They did. Uh, I think radio was very selective and I think they sort of, they verged on that whole, you know, the legalities of radio airplay. And by that I mean radio stations were only, you know, mandated to play 20%. Local. Local content. Meaning out of every 10 songs, two of them had to be Zimbabwean or African. And that was unfortunately shortchanging a lot of the artists because you'd find that now you're competing for that, you know, for, you know, if you understand how a radio works, you got 10 songs that you can play in an hour. So in that whole one hour, you are only playing two Zimbabwean artists. And you are now having to compete between System Tajida, Four Brothers, uh, Alik Mach uh, Macheso, Nicola uh, Zakaria, because, yes. Simon Chimbetu, Simon, and Paul Matavire, Paul Matavire, and Kadota as well. <laughs> Remember <laughs> Kadota? Kadota did his own song. <laughs> yes. Yeah, you're competing. Well, you got that whole Sungura mix. Then you still got Thomas Mapfumo, you know. Oliver know, Olivam Tukudzi. Olivam Tukudzi. Leonard uh, Jagata is in there. Yes, Leonard Tungai Dembo. Moyo. J James Chimombe is in there. Outside of that, you got the gospel guys. You got Charles Charamba and his his wife. You got the. Uh, you got everybody. Yeah. There. So then everyone is competing to get to be one of those two. Outside of the Rusike brothers doing their own stuff, Tasso doing his own thing, Comrade Chinks, Ilanga, uh, Fanyana Dube, Busingube, Andy Fortune Brown, Paruta. Fortune Paruta, Chioniso Mateo, Marare. Chioniso, um, Peace of Peace Ebony. Ebony, Metaphysics, you know, out of all of that, everybody's... Only two. You've got two spots in every hour. And radio only complied with those two spots. They didn't feel the need to go beyond. It was difficult as I was growing up to to recognize that because I wanted to play in the space. I wanted to get involved, but I didn't, I felt that there wasn't enough of local music being played. And when you begin to understand the dynamics of the music industry, you learn very quickly that part and parcel of the income that performers or rather artists get comes from airplay. All right. So Musicians make money from shows, but they also get money from being played on a radio station. Right. And if you're not pay, played on the radio station, you don't get paid. And as I began to delve deeper into understanding 
one, how radio works, two, how the industry works, um, I began to feel very sorry for the industry because I felt that we're dealing here with a machine that needs to be changed. So can, can you openly say one of the reasons why we didn't have an industry within the urban space is because there was no balance within that space? Yeah. Not just that, I mean, it's one of the reasons why Zimbabwe only created two or three great musicians uh, that were recognized internationally. They didn't garner the local support. And the only way that you can get the local support is if the locals are exposed to the music. So if every hour you're only hearing two songs from Zimbabweans out of 10 songs, there's the probabilities of you getting that support from the local people to push your music, at least internationally. So that's why for a long time, the biggest artists in the country have always been Sungura because on Radio 2, they are the most uh, rotated yeah. artists. Yes. So people locally within the spaces where these people consume this music, that's all they are hearing. So these yeah. people become, then they garner that support. But it was not the same on urban radio stations. Yeah. If you also just look at the demographics, Radio 2 and Radio 4 had the majority of the people. Radio 4, which is National FM, Radio yes. 2, which is Radio Zimbabwe. Radio now. Zimbabwe, yeah. yes. Radio 2 has the masses. A large majority of the population in the country listen to Radio 2. They were a lot more open to promoting one local language, but also the local artist. So I, I believe their quota uh, or percentage of local music that they played was a lot higher. They played a lot of Sungura. Um, so you'd find that they played a lot of gospel. They played a lot of, you know, Mbatanga. So you'd find that the artists who performed that kind of music got popular a lot quicker and were received by the you know, the Zimbabwean population a lot easier. Which is why you find that the Sumbura market was a very established market uh, through that push. And because of that push, it naturally, you know, falls into the other spaces. So you naturally move from being a Radio 2 great artist, you know, so four brothers were big on Radio 2, but because they're the biggest artists in the country, they naturally start getting played on all the other radio stations because... You, people didn't just listen to Radio 2. Some would switch and listen to Radio 3 temporarily and come back again to Radio 2. So because they now have the weight and influence yes, to be played across to the board. To be played across the board. Um, so urban artists struggled in that earlier uh, period. W which period is this? That is between, um, at least in, from my perspective, 1982 to, 19, to let's say 1992. Really, there was a lot of struggle for airplay uh, because they were not crossing over. They only stayed in that Radio 3 space, but within that Radio 3 space, you're still competing because, you know, Kudzi Maruza as a radio DJ has to decide whether he's going to play the biggest artist in the country, which happens to be Thomas Mafumo at the time, versus playing a Fortunum Maruza, you know, and has to juggle as to whether... It's, it, does it make better sense for me to play this? And after time, Thomas Mapumo is going to yeah. be the guy they play. And you find that because of the way radio is shaped as well, DJs played their own music. It wasn't like what we find now. Yeah, it was very cut blanche. Yeah, so the DJ tried to play all the popular hits because it's, it's in his favor to play what's popular. Because you extend the time spent listening. Exactly. From, from the so audience. So he would naturally trump you know, uh, Fortune Paruza or Chio Niso or Andy Brown and play Thomas Mapfumo or Oliver Mtukudzi or, or, you know, four it's only brothers. two songs. It's only two it's songs. only anyway. two songs. Yes. So in a whole day, you're only looking at about 48 songs. 48 songs. It's not enough. No, it and isn't. the active hours where people are listening, it's 24 songs. Yeah. The whole day. Yes. That's so horrible. If you imagine people are listening to radio between 6 o'clock and 8 o'clock and listening to radio between 4 o'clock and 6 o'clock, in that time you've played 40 songs. And out of those 40 songs, only 8 songs are Zimbabwean.
and you can't expect to build a local audience. You can't. But but, but let me let me draw your attention to something quite important. Like like at the time hip hop is becoming a worldwide phenomenon, right? Yes. Um, soul and R&B is what's popular music at the time, right? Uh, right? Within the 90s, eight, late 80s to 90s. Right. Uh, in Jamaica, there's a Jamaican phenomenon where reggae is morphing to raga, to digital music, which now becomes dancehall. Yes. And all those genres are, are precipitating towards a very small market called Zimbabwe, yes. right? And people are starting to have a taste for some of this music because they can hear it. It's being played. Yes. Dennis Wilson is playing this on the radio. Yes. That reggae. Dennis Wilson. Dennis oh Wilson goodness. is playing this. Yeah. Rest in peace, Dennis Wilson. Uh, what's his name? Um, all these people. John uh, uh, Hitman is coming, playing that hip hop. And playing the house music. Playing the house music. Yeah. So they, they are now all these urban genres, right? right? That are showing up on the radar. Right. How does that affect? Uh, or how does that impact Zimbabwe music that this, we're now starting to see defined genres that are well, showing expression? We hadn't really reached a space of a defined genre. What I noticed is I saw many players, especially people like you know, Fortune and Paruta, um, finding ways to mix this the genres yes. so within a particular song you are listening to a bit of pop you're listening to a bit of r&b you're listening to hip-hop and you're listening to house and dancehall too and dancehall like all in the same coming through and doing exactly. the things on the so it was just really grabbing what was considered to be populous or you know from the pop uh and sort of fitting it in and I think there wasn't anything established to say that this is a genre on its own. It was all, in my view, just urban. It was all just urban music. Whatever was urban at yes. the time. Yes, some, some leaned a little bit more traditional urban, meaning that they'd still have the... But it's traditional in its rhythm, but they're using a lot of all these other factors that 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 bring it back to some kind of an urban urban vibe you you, you could tell they, they had an urban influence yeah you could tell that it was still young you know mm. it was still young it was it has it has something that's not quite traditional traditional um and that we, we started seeing that with gospel i mean with gospel started you know coming in with a bit more of that house vibe you can even tell People like John Shibadura now starting mm -hmm. to have that reggae influence. Mm -hmm. They're starting to play reggae a lot Putting more. Putting it in, yes. Bring it in more. You had guys like James, uh, James, James, James Chimombe. James Chimombe, one yeah. of my personal favorites. Yeah, uh, he was just like a he was like a Teddy Pendergrass. One he of is, the, you know, with like a brass section in his music. Exactly. So he he was mimicking a lot of the Motown vibe. Uh, Oliver Mtukudzi is not too far from country. If you listen to the way that the guitar in itself, and that's where you find even people like, and I know he was contacted by a big country artist to see if they could reinterpret Neria into into a country song. Because, really? Yeah, because it, it has the country vibe, you know, the whole melody, the structure, the the way the songs are composed. So you find that guys were composing tunes, uh, you know, Brian Rusike with that beautiful song of his. Suarangu. Exactly. What a classic. Beautiful ballad. You could take that, translate it into any language, you know, as is, without really changing the melody. Because it had a lot of soul, it had a lot of R&B elements to it. So, so we're, we were already mashing up a lot of, yeah. and we're now making what was our interpretation of what urban music would sound like if it was from home. Exactly. Delaney then leave home. Mm -hmm. And and you you li you leave home you go away for a bit yeah, and that period was quite important. Can you tell me about that move and how important it was? Well, I went to study, so I had to do as the parents were asking. <laughs> um, but again, I think it just exposed me to a bigger world. Coming to South Africa was, you know, it just opened up my eyes to what is possible, and uh, trying to compare what people are doing there. Uh, here in South Africa, rather, uh, versus what people are doing in Zimbabwe. What, what was the difference? More platforms to be exposed on. All right, South Africa still maintained a 20-25% local music quota on their radio stations, you know, which they still do uh, in many great respects. 
but the only difference is that instead of having four radio stations that are doing that, you've got 400 radio stations doing that. You know, so from different radio stations being the national, the regional, the radio stations, the community stations, and also the corporate stations. So everyone is, so even if you did only have that's, you know, two songs out of every 10. But you're hearing it on 50, you're hearing a lot 50 platforms. What I noticed as well is the similarities of what was happening uh, in Zimbabwe and what was happening in South Africa. There was sort of the same thirst for a young desire, young people wanting to get involved in the industry, but not wanting to follow a traditional format. The only other similarities as well that I noticed is that the young people who were coming in wanted to, to mimic America. They wanted to mimic the UK. And when I say mimic, they really just wanted to replicate it. You must get it. Earlier in the 80s, those who came in to do urban music started off by transcending the traditional sound. Okay? Singing in Zulu, Tosa, Shona, Ndebele, whatever it was. And just sort of adding the Motown feel, adding the, the pop feel, the ABBA feel, or the Carpenters, or the Michael Jackson vibe to it. Still singing in Shona, still singing in English. So good examples are James Chimombe, for instance. Uh, he came through, uh, you know, that's, you know, that's like end of the road. To the end. Exactly oh the same my thing. God. You get what I'm saying? So he came in with that, but did it in Shona. As the years went by, guys started bringing in the English side of things, doing the same thing, hoping to get a broader audience. Mm. Because the assumption is that if I sing in English, more people will hear me. Yet in my studies, in my view, it's the exact opposite. <laughs> And I started seeing that in South Africa because in South Africa we had, we moved from Dalum Kids and we moved from Dalum Kids, Chico Selo Twala, Brenda Fassi, Pat Shange. And then we started moving into these guys called Mark and Alex. Okay, they were like an R&B duo. So they were like a, a, an English version of Jazil Brothers. Yeah, they came in with their English sort of wannabe R&B, sort of received, but not quite. You know, a lot of other people started coming in like that. Uh, what's her name? I forget her name. Uh, my African dream lady. Um, my African dream. Yeah, yeah, it'll come to me. Right. So they started coming through and singing uh, American music. In came in your, that's when the house music era as well was big in the early 90s. So all your... Dr. Victor's started coming out, your Bob Mabena's, uh, Brenda Fassi, Von Chaga Chaga. Um, a lot of South African artists also sort of doing what Zimbabwean artists were doing, because Fortune as well was also doing the same thing, coming through trying to sing in English. In came some of the hip hop artists, the Piece of Ebony's, uh, also fusing and trying to, and I can understand why they did that. You know, there was that space where you're trying to, you're trying to impress the radio station to play your music and give you that opportunity to compete with all the other artists that are coming from America. To play what? To play what everybody else this is playing. playing yeah. Because Radio 3 is telling you, I can't play you, you are too, you're not quite urban, but you're not, you're, you're not quite traditional. So you're sort of hovering in that space. So they were, we were trying to find the sound. Um, coming to South Africa, seeing exactly the same sort of thing. Which year is uh, this? This is 94, 95, 95. Yeah, because I came here when South Africa got, it got its uh, so-called independence. Um, and noticing that, you know, I began to, to question, okay, is this the direction? But the good thing is that there was also a very township vibe that had sort of immersed out of hip hop that uh, South Africa was doing a lot better than what Zimbabwe was doing. That was when the whole sound of Digong, what they called Digong at the time, which be ultimately became Guaido, started picking up at that point. You know, where your Arthurs and your Joe Ninas and uh, uh, Mdu 
just to name a few. Mosquitoes. They were all hip hop artists in my view, because they all rapped. That was one thing. They all did rap, but they did rap to a house beat. And it slowed down. Now. Slowed down. But as well, if you look at the history of music, hip hop has always been in house music. Go back to Technotronic. Pump up the jam, pump it up. You know, CNC. Oh, this is jam. CNC music. Snap. Da, 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 da. Everybody dance now. That's all hip hop. It's all hip hop with just a, a vibe. So what they did is they took the same elements but then localized it by putting the language in. And that was where it really caught on. People started getting to it because it was a young representative sound that people could identify with in their language, which could also transcend across different age groups. Plus now people with the language, I, I think what also happened with Kwaito is now people could see themselves. Yeah. B because as great as Tupac was, but we couldn't see ourselves in him. Yes. And but we, we can see ourselves in B.O.P. Yes. We and can the tell the stories. The language is the mm. same. The, 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 stories, the, the stories are the same. are the same. And the great thing is that there was, there was a radio station, YFM, that was now driving that force. Uh, YFM being a youth FM, it took on Kwaito and said, this is ours, we're going to pump it. So now you've got a scenario where you've got a dedicated medium that's pushing it. Channel O is jumping onto the same bandwagon as well, saying that we want to provide uh, opportunities for videos to be made so that people can be seen. Plus also South Africa is in a state where they, they want to they wanna get that balance right. Yeah. It's a rainbow yeah. now. They're, so it's no were, longer one story. They were very deliberate about it. Yes. So being deliberate about it, I figured something needs to be done back in Zim. But we still didn't have the multitude of radio stations. We still didn't have a television station outside ZBC. Uh, except for the short introduction of Joy TV that came in for a bit. So when I finished school, I came back uh, in 2000. And I thought, let me give it a go. And I spoke to my parents and I said, I just need a couple of years to try this. Take me back to that conversation because it's an important conversation. So come on, we, we send you to school to study. <laughs> We pay all this money uh, yeah. at, a, at a South African university, right? Yeah. As you can, as, and you can tell your siblings are coming. They also want to have this opportunity. Yeah. And you... But you see, it wasn't, it wasn't difficult to have because I remember distinctly it was my father, my first king. I call him the first king, who gave me the insight to say, you love music so much, go to ZBC and learn and i said how do i do this now you, you gotta imagine i'm a 10 year old and dad says call up one of the radio djs and see if you can go and sit in one of his shows and go and watch what they're doing and i called djs would tell me to come to zbc a 10 year old and you say come but then i wouldn't get in <laughs> they would give me some story about trying to get into the actual studio itself. And they would make me wait while I listen to the show in the foyer and they'll see me for two, three minutes at and, the end of the show. And, and, and go out. Yeah, because they couldn't get what a 10, 11 year old wanted. But my dad was very persistent. He was the encouraging king, the king who constantly pushed me in just never giving up because I got very despondent in some cases where I'd want to go and see a presenter and that presenter just didn't have time to see me uh, but I did eventually get a breakthrough I got a windfall through Kudzima Ruza. Kudzima Ruza, the great Kudzima Ruza. Yes so I great, got a great opportunity to be entertained by Kudzima Ruza. Um, he gave me the opportunity to come and sit in his studio not say much he showed me a little bit of this what was happening and I sat there as a three year old, as, a, as a, an 11 year old, just watching him. It was the most exhilarating experience. And I asked him if I can come again more often. And he gave me that privilege. My dad would take me there at night while Kudzi was doing Hitsville, I'd sit. And, and I got into this rhythm with him where he would now 
tell me, you know, do this for me, do this for me, organize these jingles that need to be organized, pull this record out of my bag, I need this, I need that, and slowly. And you were 11 at the time? Yeah. Um, and I did that, I did that religiously throughout the holidays. And then from Kudzi, I started talking to Peter Jones. PJ, the great PJ. And from PJ, I then introduced, got introduced to my second king. Cool. Kimbo Rogers. Kimbo Double K Rogers. Back at you, Kimbo Double K Rogers, representing one of Dilani Makalinga's kings. I be the second king. And it's quite apt because I'm all about the two thing. You understand what I'm saying? Yeah. Two kings, two K. Ah, oh, double K, I get it. Nice. <laughs> Kimbo Rogers transformed my view on music because not only did he show me the ropes in a radio station, he taught me a lot about the art of DJing. He taught me the history of music. He was much older than me. He knew a lot of music from the 70s. He knew the, the, the mixology of the craft. Exactly what I was about to say. People don't know this, but Kimbo Rogers is the first person in Zim to start mixing records yeah. using cassettes. Yes. And just by listening, and he tells the story that he, he started doing this by listening to WBLS tapes. Mm -hmm. It's like, wait a second, we can do this. Right. I got the concept of mixing from hearing uh, overseas cassette tapes. I used to try and match the beat of the song on the right turntable to the song that's playing on the left, either by manipulating it by finger, speeding it up so it will catch up to the beats, or slowing it down with the finger so it will slow down and match the beats and then turn the fader up and introduce the other song. So that was on vinyl. Then. I used to do what was called cassette mixing. So that's a bit what I'm a bit more notorious for in some of my circles is mixing from cassette to cassette. Because what I would do is I would count each and every beats per minute of the song when I used to write the title on the cassette and then have the BPM written next to the song. Then songs that had similar BPM I would put on one cassette and make a, 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 an, extreme, a, an exact copy of that one cassette. So I will go from song one to song two effortlessly and then go from song two to song three on the other cassette effortlessly just by using the pause button. So uh, what would happen is I used to take off the top cover of the cassette of the cassette player. All right. And then uh, press play, wait for the beat to start. As soon as it starts, duh, press pause. Then I'd use my finger manually on the cassette tape, pull it back. Zhit, while it's on pause, and then while the beat is happening there, just waiting with the pause, with my, with my finger on the pause button, on the five, six, seven, eight, and let go. They're playing together, and fade off the other one. Kimball took me on because sometimes I, 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 I couldn't always get the opportunity to be in the studio with the, the primetime DJs, PJ and Kudzi, because they had so much going on at the time, and the studios, as you know, are very small, so you can't really accommodate too many people. But Kimball would come over during the weekends. He had a Friday and a Saturday show. So he would accommodate me. And further to that, Kimball would invite me to his house. And he would say, come over to the house. I'd spend the whole Saturday with Kimball. Um, and in that, he's, it was really like a musical lesson. So how Delaney and I started hanging out a bit more often uh, than was necessary, it was because of purely for the love of music. So since I already had a, a camaraderie and friendship with his dad and then got to meet the dad's children and brought his son on radio, uh, we were almost, almost, almost fam on, on a level, so to speak. So on occasion, I'd go there for lunch, we'd eat together. Uh, when I would go out DJing, Delani would sometimes come and then he'd get to hear uh, the, 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 the way I would count my beats in and where I would be able to mix my music. And I think also it might have contributed to him coming up as a producer. I was learning about music I didn't know. I learned a lot about the history of music. I learned a lot about rhythm, break beats. I learned about you know, what makes a good pop song, what makes it kick. Um, and for years, Kimball and I developed a relationship 
from that point when I was 11 to when I was 18, I went to university and still now we're still good with very good friends. I wonder if it was a, a case of me either meeting his dad first, then it was Delani. It might have been his dad first. His dad used to operate uh, 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 a retail outlet in the middle of town and um, in his display cabinet because it was a lot of antiques especially like Rhodesian antiques, stamps and, you know, stuff like that, collector's items. And in the one, in the one section of the shop, you used to have these nice watches. So I used to be a little bit of a, a, a watch aficionado. I was, you know, I was trying to get a collection. I didn't get far. But uh, from the, the banter and conversation that developed because of my regularity at the shop, it got us talking about music and stuff, and I think that's when he had let me know that uh, his son was an aspiring musician. And I think it was through his dad that uh, I had mentioned, I know he should come around to the studio sometime, because at the time I was at uh, ZBC, the Zimbabwe Broadcasting Corporation, Radio 3, uh, one of the producer presenters there. And I had a show called Talent Quest. You and Kimball uh, were the first people to do some sort of... Uh, talent uh, search yes. <laughs> on the radio. Tell me about that. Yeah, um, somewhere in that whole thing, I was 15, 14, we decided um, let's discover and give local artists a platform. Kimball, very passionate about local musicians, wanting to see locals also you know, thrive, uh, took on to the idea that let's, let's do this, you know, and he dedicated uh, a portion of his radio show to talent. The only thing is now, I'm still learning how to make beats. I'll come back to how uh, that all started. I'm still learning how to make beats. Uh, Kimball was now using break beats, what are called break beats. So it's, it's that little beginning, the drum beat of, of a particular song before the vocals kick in. So he would cut those things up and chop them up and make it into it like a three minute drum beat. And what I would do, I, I would create my own little like beat loops on cassette tape and then transfer it onto the reel to reel tapes at the, at the, at the studio. So I would just repeat uh, a, a certain section of a drum beat for like about three minutes straight and play that back for singers or rappers to rap over uh, for the recording sessions. Cause there wasn't, I didn't have a, a, a lot of instrumentals that people liked. They would sing for me, they would, rap for me over the phone. I would decide whether they got talent or not. If they had talent, invite them to the studio. Now, he had a radio show that started in the evening at five or six o'clock in the evening and ran for three hours. So one hour of that three hour period was dedicated just to introducing new talent. Uh, but this new talent didn't have demos. This new talent didn't have any records. It was just young people in high school, young people in varsity who just wanted space. So we thought, can't we utilize the ZBC facilities? ZBC, as you know, has got several studios that they don't use, <laughs> <laughs> that they didn't use. And because he was a member, a staff member of the broadcasting institution, he would hire that studio early in the morning from 10 o'clock. So from 10 o'clock till about Four o'clock. You're recording those artists. We're recording those artists. So I got the opportunity to start practicing some of these things that I was learning. Who are some of these artists who made it? Who oh, might gosh. probably know? Oh, no. Well, I, some just sort of were fly by night. I remember Tricks and Games. Oh, Tricks and Games. I remember a lady called Shingai Chada. She, she was brilliant. I think she left and went to, the, to overseas. There was a lot of great vocalists that came about, all doing hip hop and doing R&B, some doing raga. Um, and I'm sure they, they, they did something with their art. But as well, I was 15 years old. So we would, we would record them for two, three minutes and then play them on air and give them a bit of a voice. And it was just purely break beats. There was nothing, there was no instrumental, there was nothing. Sometimes we'd use instrumentals that were there uh, and showcase them on radio. And this program was called Talent Quest. Um, it was probably one of the very first sort of talent, talent shows that we, we did. Um, and thank goodness 
uh, for what Kimball did uh, in being able to teach me because uh, in that space I learned about mic techniques, I learned about the actual physical side of recording. And we were sort of learning together because he sort of knew how to use the studio as well. But he had a lot more than I did, you know, so we learned a lot about that. I had learned about miking, putting mics together. He would make the break beats, we'd record the vocalists, I would start directing them and showing them, okay, no, give us a bit more of this, a little bit of that. And that's sort of where sort of the practical side of what I was dreaming about began. Um, in school, first year, uh, or was it second year, uh, form two, I met a young man uh, by the name of Nyarai Mamukwa. Uh, amazing guy. Um, he had the fortune of having this synthesizer that his mother had purchased for him in the States. His mother lived in the States. And he brought it to school to show everybody at school. But didn't know how to play. Of course, we couldn't believe you. You have a synthesizer at home. Yeah, like how? You know, so he's busy fiddling around with this thing, doesn't know it. I'm looking at this thing thinking this is a dream come true. I speak to Nyarai, become friends with him, and yeah. He allowed me to borrow that synthesizer because he hardly used it. So I would go all the way to his house in Greyston Park. Now, I'm staying in Mount Pleasant. So I would walk from Mount Pleasant. I was 13. I would walk from Mount Pleasant to Greyston Park. Okay. Borrow the synthesizer. Yeah, not even just walk. I'd actually take my bike from Mount Pleasant to Greyston Park to borrow the synthesizer and carry the synthesizer while I'm on a bike. Right. Right. And he would let me use the synthesizer throughout the, the whole holiday. And uh, come to the end of the holiday, I'll take it back. Right. Um, and I would use it as well on free weekends whenever we're not at boarding school. Because he, he brought it that one time, but never brought it again to school. So and he brought it so you could see it, so that you yeah, could well, know he was he was showing it to his friends. <laughs> and every, of course. You know, yeah, so... Um, that's sort of where I started learning the art of programming. Because, yeah, because the synthesizer I've got this, yeah, and this synthesizer could record. So I started learning and teaching myself how to make beats on that synthesizer at the age of 13, uh, looping the break beats on that. And uh, that's when the neighborhood started getting to know me. Uh, young cats who wanted to rap. Uh, who wanted to sing, started to know about what I was doing, and I will just make beats for free. And we would go to each other's house, then I met a guy called Gary, who had a computer, and he was like, we could mic link this up to the computer and use the sound card, and slowly but surely we began to sort of and create the sort of It is important studio. to note that at the time, all those things you're mentioning were very expensive. Yeah. A synthesizer is a very expensive. Yes. A, a, a computer was very expensive. Before it was a personal computer, it was quite expensive. Yeah. Uh, and I, we couldn't afford it. Uh, my parents, you know, do, you know, wanted me just to focus on my school. Uh, they had no issues supporting what I was doing. But I didn't think, you know, to start investing and going that far, it wasn't that much. Uh, whereas uh, Nyarai, he got that synthesizer from his mother, mother thinking, oh, this is what the young boys like these days, but he as well didn't have too much of an interest in using it. And I think that divine connection of us um, coming together, being in the same school, you know, learning together, and as well, you know, him being gracious, um, I, that changed my life. It changed the way I, I viewed things. So, so I now know two kings, because you mentioned them as kings. Yes. There's your dad, who's the first king. Yes. Then there's Kimball Rogers. Yes. Double K. Yes, the man what? who taught me radio, he taught me a lot about radio, a lot about radios, and my love for radio stems from that era. And just music in general. And the history of music. And, and to understand it. Yes, and Kimball used to take me to clubs. <whistles> I shouldn't say this. He used to take me to clubs. Um, he used to take me to clubs. Uh, I was the only underage allowed in a club because I would go around carrying his CD bag and his record bag. And, uh, but one thing I was not allowed to do, I was not allowed to drink um, any liquid that was dark, number one. And he would always come test, check. 
but I was. Oh, so he was also responsible for you in that manner. Yeah, I mean, he spoke to the owners and whatnot, but I would go into clubs with him, following him, literally doing whatever little work. If he needed to go to the toilet, I was the guy who looked after the stuff. Um, and so I learned the club scene, and he would teach me, look at this song and what it's going to do to the people. So having that n knowledge of what a song does to people and how people respond to it, you know, I learned so quickly that that song is good and it makes people dance because of one, two, three. Because I'm studying, I'm looking and everything I'm studying. So for me, it wasn't go there and have a great time. For me, it was study. And that's when I got to meet a lot of the greats, uh, the Calvin's Fellanis. Uh, Soul Supreme. The Soul Supreme, I got to meet uh, this, uh, the mixed DJs, JD Jams. Um, I got to meet a lot of different, 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 play, different players who, you know, who were involved in the club scene. We moved from one club to we, the next. We, we, which are some of the clubs that Kimbo used to play in, which oh, were popping the, at the time? All of them, I mean, from Circus right through to Turtles, right through to Sarah's. So we would do a lot of those. We also did a lot of private functions as well, you know. So it was just a lot of exposure in that regard. And I didn't only just do it for Kimball now. I started getting into relationships with going back again to Kudzi, Maruza. You know, I'd go and see Kudzi uh, a lot of the time just to spend time with him, uh, grab some music from him, because I was always known in high school as the guy with the latest music because I knew all the DJs. I spent a great amount of time with um, George Manetzi. Oh, what a man. Later joined Kai FM, spent 20 years there, yeah. a good 20 years. Exactly. Still one of uh, the greatest broadcasters so in the producer. Spent yeah. a lot of great time with George Manetzi as well. Um, fantastic knowledge of music. He had a different, a different spin on music. Yeah, people say he's the first guy to introduce rare grooves. Yeah. He was that guy. He, he played the, the stuff that you didn't hear. Right. Um, Hitman, who's here, Singende, was such a strong influence as well. Hitting you me. between the ears. Oh, yeah. In terms of just the love and appreciation of, of good music. I was such a house fanatic. Um, loved house music. One of the first people to play it on the radio. Yeah. And he, he also brought stuff that you just never thought. You know, it was just out of this world. Peter Jones still remains as one of the greats. What, what, what made Peter Jones so great? Well, I think people don't understand how great Peter Jones his, was. His clinical, it was that perfectionist radio, I think, for me. His radio just sounded flawless every time. It, it was a well-packaged product and it sounded perfect every time, hands down. Kudzi Maruza, don't take away. Kudzi Maruza is one of the greatest radio broadcasters. I think a lot of people sort of downplay his great and immense talent purely because he doesn't have an English or European accent, you know, a very strong one, like maybe the rest of us. He didn't, doesn't sound like he went to, you know, you know, major private school like some of us, but the phenomenal talent behind Kudzi. Right. And also just knowing his story as to where he started, you know, having started in the library. And you moving know, all the way up to the, all the way, to behind you know, the mic. Uh, he's just, he's very underrated and You've seen what's happening on the other side of the Limpopo. Yeah. Quite as now a thing. You've seen YFM and what it can do. And you come back home armed with a college degree, but you're telling your parents, I don't want to do this. Yeah. In fact, I want to give it a go in this music thing. And your first king, which is your dad, then tells you, yes, you can, right? Yeah. What happens after this? Where do you start? I start with my third king. Who? <coughs> Gilbert Mubawarirwa. What a man. Gilbert Mubawarirwa, I met Gilbert Mubawarirwa when I used to do studio hopping. What studio hopping was for me was I went to every person I knew in the whole of Harare who had a studio. There was no one I didn't know. Who were some of these people? Uh, Gilbert. Gilbert didn't have a studio at the time when I met him. I was 14 when I met Gilbert. Uh, he was building a studio. He was a marketing director for one of the big B8, yeah, for BAT. Oh, you met Gilbert when you were only 14? Yeah. I met Gilbert when I was 14, and he and I shared the love of music. He had uh, started working for BAT Zimbabwe. He was a marketing manager there, and wanted to set up a studio. 
but knew nothing about, <laughs> you know, knew a little bit of, you know, playing instruments, but, you know, really just sort of loved the idea of setting up a studio. I think something that he also sort of got when he was studying in the UK. You know, he thought, this could be done, this could be done. And so Gilbert and I, uh, when I met him, you know, he started advertising a studio because he had just bought a little computer and a keyboard. So the digital era is starting yes. to... Yes, so that whole digital era had kicked in, but he was also trying to figure out how do we connect these things, how do these things work. So I, re I remember vividly myself, Gilbert, and a guy called uh, Anthony Malama, Malema. Um, we were in his house with Cubase version 1, the very, very first Cubase Steinberg software. So young. You're still 14 then? Yeah, about 14. Yeah, I was a long time ago. <laughs> so, so had you already yeah. started so Shamiso like Entertainment what? then? No, he hadn't. He was just a young man who had a love for music, had invested the time and the energy to, and the money to, to get started. Right. So I started just developing that relationship with him because he welcomed me into his home, you know, him and his wife. And uh, we just sort of started trying to figure things out. And then it came to those points where Gilbert would say, come to a sleepover, you know, so during the weekends. On a Friday, I'd go to Gilbert's. On a Saturday, I was with Kimbo. You know? Right. So my whole weekend was taken up, and then Monday I'm back at school for another two weeks. Another until, two weeks, you come back. Free weekend, back again. I knew my Friday, I'm at Gilbert's. Saturdays, I'm at Kimbo's, and it was just that rotation. Right. And in between, sometimes the Saturday, I'll be seeing George Minetzi. Uh, on mm. that Friday night, I would have spent time with Kudzi, and you know, so there was a lot of. So you knew what your weekends were going to be like. Yeah, I knew much. my weekends, and I was. Uh, during the holidays, I started then doing studio hopping, where I started seeing now Tendai and Furutsa. Tendai and Furutsa, aka Prince Tendai? Prince Tendai. Had yes. Set the, where he, was the studio? High Density Studios was right in the middle of town, Harare Drive. Is it Ro Robert Mugabe? Robert Mugabe. Yeah. Everyone yeah. talks about that studio. One floor up, so I spent time there. I used to go and see Kelly, because Kelly Rizika was doing adverts with Shared Studios. Shared Studios. Where was Shared um, Studios? Shared was in Masasa. Masasa. Yes. I Before then, I'd see Keith Farkasen as well. I spent a session watching Ilanga being recorded. Um, with Keith Farkasen, um back in down in Bar Baridol. I attended one studio time with a guy called Stuart Cater. Stuart Cater? Yeah. Who's this guy? Uh, just another guy who had set up a studio. I think he'd, he had come from the band era of music and he, I'm sure at some point probably was just involved in the music industry but now sort of semi-retired, set up a little studio offering it out for people to, you know. So uh, there was another guy called Tony Adonis. Adonis, yeah, Tony yeah. Adonis. Tony Adonis had a studio set up. Where and was the, Tony Adonis' studio? Tony moved several times now. I can't remember the very first one, but I think it was out in, also like in Rhodesville. Is it Rhodesville? Mm -hmm. Is that the area called? Yes, yeah, what's called, yeah. Rhodesville, Greendale sort of side. D, at this point, you are studio hopping. You, and you're visiting all the studios. Like, this is a place of work for certain men. Yes, it is. Why are you there? What's, what's the point of you being there? What, what are they saying you're doing there? It takes me back to my father. My father kept saying, learn. Learn as much as you can. And I knew that in this formative period of my life, between 13 and whenever, I just had to learn because I didn't have the capacity to participate in the industry because I was still at school. So all I could do was just to absorb and all I wanted to was to be in a studio. All I wanted to do was to, to ask the questions. So being an inquisitive, young, curious child, I would call these people, I would visit and knock on their door and I would ask Princeton Dai, please, can I just come to your studio, sit, watch what you do. Was he the producer there? Um, he ran around pretty much like a, the owner, wearing his lovely suits. Um, amazing man. Um, but as well, he also had that moment, that time, he would sit there and say, Mfana, and he would tell me a few things. He would teach me a little bit about the industry. I would ask him about his own songs. 
some of the people who are in the studio were just using the studio just to create their own produce and products. Um, so it was just that space of just learning. So I would call Prince Tendai, Kelly Rusike, can I just come and sit? Isaac Chirwa, can I just come and sit? Uh, Keith Farkerson, can I just come and sit? Um, and they would let me, you know, a curious little kid. And while I'm there, in the moments when I can see that, okay, they're not being serious right now, let me ask. But not only did I do that, it took, got me the opportunity to meet the musicians who were coming in to also get their take. Because some of them were coming just to pay for studio time and do whatever they need to do. Some of them were just session musicians. They're coming to play a guitar or they're coming to play keyboards or they're coming to do backing vocalists, vocals. So I just got an opportunity to just sit and just immerse myself in that space. Um, and when they were all gone and there was a moment and a little breather, uh, I could ask the questions and say, what does this button do? What is this for? Why did you record them like that? What, what was the importance of doing that? Why did you make him sing it three times over? You know, and they... Who was, who, who was uh, one of your favorite producers at the time? My teachers. All of them, I can't really say favorite. I really, I really, I really, I, I learned a lot from Keith Farquharson. Cause, um, what a man. Because he was already a little bit more advanced in terms of the studio equipment. Um, his studio is a lot more advanced. Kelly Rusika too, you know. Kelly Rusika taught a lot, you know, about vocal technique and just learning, you know, showing showing me how vocals are recorded, you know, because he, he himself being a vocalist, you know, knew how to bring it out of people. So just watching people like him. Prince Tendai uh, learned a lot, I uh, learned a lot about just the mechanisms of the industry. You know, what are you doing next? You know, you told me, ah, I'm just gonna go make some cassettes for my new CD character or whatever, you know, he was doing at the time. Um, so it was picking up all these little elements from these guys. I called even Fortune in Baruta. Uh, Fortune just met with me for a brief, a brief coffee. Uh, but Not at the studio? No, uh, Fortune didn't allow people to go into the studio. Why? I don't know. <laughs> Everyone has a story that no, if you, you just uh, don't walk into Fortune's no, studio. No, you don't. Uh, Fortune was very delicate about his studio space. Right. Um, but just that brief coffee, he was one of the, the very first people that I knocked on. And I met him at the Monomatapa because he used to have a session there. He used to play the piano. Yeah, he used to have a session. Sing. Yeah, yeah so he covers had, and stuff. Yeah, he had a session there. So he told me, come after my session, wait for me. He gave me 10, 15 minutes while my dad was sitting in the car. And he, he, I asked him, I had like a list of questions. I'm a little kid. I'm saying, so how do you do this? What is this? How, you know, and I, I ran them quickly. He quickly downloaded some information. That was the first time I met Fortune, and then I got to meet him much later after I'd produced Handi Rege. So, uh, n now you take me to a very interesting era, because Handi Rege is like a pivotal moment in your career, but it's, it, it's only much later. They, yeah. they are much more um, seismic moments before that. Yeah. Which brings me to 2000, you are looking to get into the industry you reconnect with Gilbert Mvavarirwa. What happens after that? Where is Shamisu Entertainment? Yeah. What's your position? Are you a producer yet? What, what's happening in your life then? By How then, old are you? By then I'd already been making beats. So you can imagine from the experience I'd been getting from when I was a kid using Arai's keyboard. Um, I'd gotten quite proficient at making beats. In my second year at university, I started an internship with a company called Nebula Boss Records. They had a contract with Universal and Michael Tellinger, the owner of the company, took me on and said, come and learn about the recording industry. And he put me under the A&R wing, pretty much what I'd been doing all along. But this time it was for real, real. You know, you're working for a record company and I wasn't getting paid. I was just a simple A&R. A uh, young executive, and then I got the opportunity to be in studios, big high-tech studios in in Cape Town, and at that which time, which is where you were at school. Yeah, and at that time, while I was there, uh, I asked Michael Tellinger if he could give me an opportunity just to produce something, and then he says, "Sure, pick a studio where you want to go and create something for me." 
because I pitched to him a new act called Guess. <laughs> um, so um, Guess was the vocal group that I had formed. I formed up the group under the name Second Nature, which was originally two people uh, whilst we were still in high school. That's when I formed it up with Odias Mutawarira. Of course, and Peter was food. Yes, food. <laughs> <laughs> Wow. <laughs> so, um, Audius and I formed up Second Nature, which evolved into a group called Cliché. Cliché was now the introduction of uh, Kenneth Jonasi, Mr. Bell. Of course. The introduction of Rutendo Mushambi. Mm -hmm. He did a computer science degree at the University of Zimbabwe. Lionel, who's out in the UK now. Um, Tafira Nika Maoso. The six of us, we formed up the group Cliché. What we did is we used to do weddings, go out and sing at weddings. We used to sing at restaurants. And during our O-level break, we got a contract at a restaurant called Chase's Restaurant in Mount Pleasant. And we were singing there four or five times a night for extra cash and for a bit of experience. We were an a cappella group, so we were like a boys to men, take six type group. Right. We sang, did harmonies. And then I formed up another group, a female version of Cliché, which was called Touché. <laughs> um, this featured uh, a young lady called Aida Fasia Golakai. Fasia was also on the future. Yes. Yeah. Uh, it featured a great vocalist, Fadzai Sakupanya, Faith. Uh, they joined up and they formed up. Touche. Touche. So they would sing when we were taking a break. Also a cappella, very R&B uh, group. And we would be practicing throughout, you know, the holidays uh, at any given time, learning vocal techniques, harmonizing, doing cover, cover songs. And in between, we introduced a couple of our own songs. Then we sort of dissolved. Went to different places. Because... Went into different places after, after O-Levels. Um, Taffy went to the States, Leon wanted to go to the UK, uh, but he st stuck around. Um, Pretendo, the oldest, he was, he was doing first year university at the time. Um, Mr. Bell, or Ken, Ken Jonasi was looking to go to Rhodes, I was going to UCT. The ladies as well, they were all going in their different directions. But what it taught me that period was how to learn, how to work with vocalists, how to work with with singers because as much as I could sing as much as I had a I think a singing voice I, I always assumed the producer role yeah, where I would give the techniques teach the harmonies say okay that's not good I need more of this and I was very strict about it uh, very hard so, so, so when do you put together guests and how do you put together the demo that then you present so to we do a demo uh, through Michael Tellinger um, that I, I was pitching. Because Michael Tellinger and Nebula Boss were an independent record label that was looking for new unsigned artists. They had an agreement with Musica, which is the biggest uh, retail Just, store retail store in South Africa. And we were given our own shelf in the store where we would put all the independent artists. And I thought, okay, this is a great opportunity to introduce guests. But at the time, Guess was just myself and a guy called Donda Kumar. Donda was my best friend at Varsity. Uh, we formed up a singing group there. And that's when Cliché evolved into Guess. Um, and it was just the two of us. Mr. Bell was still sort of part of Guess, but he was on the other side of the country. He was in Grahamstown, Grahamstown yeah. while we were in Cape Town. Audius was still part of Guess, sort of, but he's in Australia. Australia yeah. So um, Donda and I did the, the demo. It was sort of well received, it, uh, but Michael didn't really do anything about it. He couldn't place it. It was an R&B song. We decided to take this, we hoid it, we got it played on Metro FM. Right. This is 1998. 98. But at the time, what this teaches you is your, more abil your ability as a producer. Yes. More than your ability to yes. sing. Yes, because we created, we created three songs in that studio um, and 
I did all the the production for it, and it gave programming us, the drums, the, yeah, the chords, making, everything, doing the drums, playing all the pianos, and it gave me so much confidence that I could actually do this uh, so well that they. Eddie Zondi played it on Metro FM. Really? Uh, the yeah. great Eddie Zondi? Yeah, and, and <laughs> it's interesting, I met him years later again. <laughs> um, yeah, Eddie Zondi played it on Metro FM and started hitting a, a cycle on Metro FM because it was an English song, uh, R&B English, uh, very, very you know, much like a Boys to Men uh, ballad, uh, just the two of us doing vocals. Um, and yet we presented it like we were a four-man outfit. You know, um, and that moved us to the 99 when Donda and I finished school and we wrote, we, we presented a song, uh, wrote and presented a song to Miss South Africa to be part of the pageant. My thinking was, we're a new artist, we want to get exposure. Where do you get exposure? Let's go to TV. Okay, so what can we do on TV? Let's go and sing for Miss South Africa. Let's write a nice, beautiful song for her. So oh, it started off as a little joke. We then thought, let's just record it. So we got some studio time in Cape Town. Did a quick demo, sent it through. The guy said, come over to Joburg. Okay. Late 99, around, yeah. In fact, not even before that, like mid 99. We went to Joburg. Um, to see if we can get the song. They liked it so much, they made it the theme song of the Miss South Africa beauty pageant. Get out of here. Yeah, it's a song This called. is 1999? Yeah. Before you come back home. So when you come back home, you've got a different level of confidence. Yeah. You're not the same dude who was... No. You're not that guy anymore. Yeah. So, so what happens? Like, how do you reconnect with Gilbert and Vavadi, who was your third king? Yeah. And then how do you guys establish so, what should be one of the most important moments in Zimbabwe music history, which is the future? So we finish off with that song. Uh, it becomes a theme song of Miss South Africa Beauty Pageant. We perform it there. Really? Live on TV. Yeah. We performed it live on TV. The three of us, we called Mr. Bell, Ken Jonasi, to join us. So the three of us were on stage. We, that was the end of 99. Then soon after that, we left. We come back to Zim, and that time I'm thinking, oh, what do we do? What do we do? But in this process, we had also been offered several recording contracts. Because of that song? Because of us being on television. Yes. Because while we were at the Miss South Africa beauty pageant, we were given several contracts. Uh, we were made promises by Yvonne Chaga Chaga, Chico Twala, and a couple other people to say, come back, we want to record you, we want to take you into the industry, do something with you. So we've been given a contract by Sony. We've been given a contract by Jessica Mutaung, uh, the daughter of Kaiser Chief. She had a record company with her husband, Ken Simmons. So we've been given a contract by the two, and we're sitting there trying to figure out which way are we coming, which way are we going. So we go home, because we finished our studies, our permits are over, we now need to obviously renew New permits, yeah. Yeah, so we come back and we're trying to figure out. So I came back here with Donda, Donda being a South African. He also wanted to see Zimbabwe. So he came, he stayed with us. And that's where. the mom plays in the house? Yeah, at my parents' place. And that's when we reconnect with Gilbert. So I said, let's go see my friend Gilbert. Because I've known him since I'm 14. I'm now 20 something. Let's go see Gilbert. So we all go see Gilbert. Gilbert has now built a studio. By this time, Gilbert has set up Shamiso. Uh, 